Thank How you. are you? I'm doing great. Um, it's an honor to talk to you. I've waited years to say thank you for Sweeter. I grew ah. up listening to Sweeter. So I, unbelievable song. And this is an unbelievable kind of time going into the BET Awards. Um, can you tell us about, I know there's a lot of things that's a little different, but what does this year's BET Awards mean to you? Uh, it, it means everything. Um, I've stated and I tell you again that it's almost like coming home. Uh, listen, going back to the days of Sweeter when we would sing it on Bobby Jones on Sunday morning. So it's almost like family reunion. It, it, it was almost as though my family said, we appreciate your work. We appreciate right. your contribution. So tonight or t this whole award season, um, I'll celebrate this one because it means that much to me. Right. Now you are nominated for I Made It. What does that song, there's so many songs that you've done. What does that song in particular kind of mean to you? What is the inspiration behind that? I Made It Out was written to encourage everybody that was going through and it was written uh, actually released at least three, four months before uh, COVID-19. So, you know, we, we were not preparing for that, but now I want it literally to become um, uh, the anthem of this season because many people be it coming out of the hospital, be it going through and, and maintaining at home quarantine for however long. When you come out, you have a legal right to give God some glory. So I want, I made it out to be that song that you can sing and really realize maybe not just this, maybe it was a, a bad job, a bad marriage, bad uh, opportunity or anything that happened in life that you struggle through, I want this song to be your victory dance number. Right, and you've been doing this for many years. Uh, I believe you started around in 1984. What right. constantly keeps you motivated? I'm, I'm super motivated all the time because I never allow one source to encourage me. You know, it could be a tree, it could be a deer running through the backyard, whatever it is. I've just used life itself to motivate me to continue to write. And even in those seasons when I didn't want to, the song continued to come. I was telling somebody when George Floyd, uh, uh, when he died um, that same night, you know, a song immediately came came to me, let, let me breathe. And uh, so I recorded it. I, I think I did an Instagram post with it. And I, I continue to, to we finish the studio session with that song. I've always been the one that wanted to give a message of hope in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the turbulence. Not only can you live, we made it out. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a particular kind of, I know you're an ordained minister as well, your pastor. Yes. Is there a particular uh, passage or part of the Bible that really speaks to you during these kinds of these times of trouble that, you know, everyone can look forward to and then kind of read to inspire yeah, absolutely. them? That there's a text in the Bible, and, and I quoted it once today. Uh, it's Hebrews 4 and 15, for we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities at all points he was tempted like as we are yet without sin. That scripture has always kind of held me down in seasons like this. Right before COVID-19, I was prepared to do so much. I was um, getting ready to work on new music. I was getting ready to buy a new house. I was getting ready to get married. So many things were getting ready to happen. And I said, literally, I'm not going to do those things you know, the, 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 the season of pandemic, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what's gonna happen. And the Lord really spoke to me and said three words, who am I, you know? You've been teaching this faith, and now it's time for you to stand on it. So I pursued the things that I desired by faith. So I hope that scripture reminds everybody that, that, that he's not dealing with you complaining because he's been there, he understands it, and he understands who you are in this season. Okay. Now, is there also kind of a particular song, either yours or from anybody else that you really love currently at this moment? Yeah, right now uh, I, I'm singing, what song am I singing more now? I, I've been working on a little hymn album, like hymns, mm -hmm. and, um, and um, I've been doing hymns and Kojic or church classics. Mm -hmm. So I've been hanging around. There's a song called, There's Not a Friend Like the Lowly Jesus. I've been humming that pretty good last three or four days. That's very nice. I like that. I look forward to whatever you have that's coming out soon. Well, listen, I've got a, I'm working on a movie about my father called The Lost Song. We're five oh, wow. scenes away from being done. That's about my father in 1947 who gets a record deal on the way to New York. Ku Klux Klan turned their bus around and shoots yeah. the tire out. They walk literally back to Durham. Great movie. 
It tells how he was encouraged. He never wanted to name a son after him, but he agrees to name his last son, John, um, because my father's cousin was going to take them to the hospital. And he said, well, the only way I'm going to take you is you name that baby after me. So my daddy said, I'm not going to name him after you without putting my name there. So I was named John Prince Key. That's where I got my name from. But it's a great movie of good gospel music, um, a good triumphant story of, of, of hanging in there. Um, I do a, a tour in the movie with uh, James Cleveland, um, the Caravans, and quite a few other artists. Uh, my son, John P. Key, the third place, my dad in the movie, and Bishop Branch Allen plays him at the end. So it's, it's gonna be a great movie. And I'm excited about finishing that soundtrack as well as shooting the last five scenes right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, wow. How long has that been in the works? I've been working on the movie two years now. We okay. really worked. When I tell you, we shot the movie all over the United States. We, we shot from, San Jose, California. I tell you, you will see, we spent time, we spent money in trying. It was my first time uh, in the director's chair. So I wanted to make sure I came uh, out of the seat, you know, kind of knowing what I'm doing. I was the critic. I could watch a movie, I saw everything wrong. And that's the only th uh, uh, education I guess I brought to the table. But I'm able to really, really kind of look at where we are. I've seen 90% uh, um, of the footage and I'm super happy with what we have. Right. Now, being so involved with that movie and also doing the music with it, what would you say kind of inspires you? Would it be like the scene when it comes to the music? Is it the scene first or is it what kind of what you hear going on and how you want that scene to go? I need to tell you that this movie has been in the works in my mind since 1980, 81. I never mm -hmm. went to a Tyler Perry play. I never went to any musicals. I stayed away because I thought it was going to be a play. And I didn't want to adapt or adopt anything that I'd seen. Uh, 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 so it's been in my mind. So I was like ready for it. So when I sat down and began to write the movie, the actual movie, I knew certain things I had to tell. Uh, I had to tell the scene that we were 16 of us growing up. And when we didn't have food, my, my dad would go to the cornfield up the street and tell my mom to ride down the street. And whenever uh, uh, she'd come back, just, you know, flick the lights on and off and he'd throw the corn, she would come down and blow the horn. He'd have to run out so he would get shot. All of these stories. I get to share in the movie. I get to share the bus, the actual bus they had in 1947. I found one in Minneapolis. I purchased that bus and I restored it to look just like their bus in 47 that actually was owned by my uncle William. So little things like that. We were just, I'm super inspired by the actual events. And uh, we played with history a little bit. I think Mahalia Jackson dies in 72. We let her live three extra years and we changed her name to Mabel. So I played with history just a little bit. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And lastly, I, during the whole quarantine thing, there's been a lot of versus battle. And we saw one with Kirk Franklin and Fred Hampton. If you was involved, is there someone that you would love to battle? Um, I did one with uh, Hezekiah Walker and it came out pretty good. We were the first and uh, it was real good. I got to share or showcase some of the old music. But if I had to do um, one more, I'd do it with a good quartet singer. Uh, I'd do it with Doc McKenzie, John P. Key versus Doc McKenzie, and make it happen for me. Oh, I like that very much. And I promise you, if I do it, I'll do your song. Sweeter than anything I know. I'm so excited. Oh, my gosh. That would be great. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Oh, this is a great and, and a blessing. And thank you so much for speaking with me. And always know I'm your Uncle John. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank Very you. Very true. Thank you. That's special.